My promotion to captain came on the first day of May 1943. Shigure's skipper, Lieutenant Commander Kimio Yamagami, gave a party in my honour. The officers crowded the gun room to congratulate me and toast me with sake. After a couple of drinks, Yamagami said hesitatingly, The crew has been working hard for the past 40 days without any real relaxation. I see that factory ship Akashi is showing a movie tonight. Do you think I might allow the men to go see it? It pained me to refuse this reasonable request, but I explained, I know we are on a rough schedule seven days a week, but it is necessary. Do not think me harsh, but we cannot afford to let up one bit at this critical time. That silenced Yamagami, a very mild man, but Lieutenant Toshio Doi, the torpedo officer, spoke up. Captain Hara, forgive my bluntness, but I don't understand why the men can't have some respite. They'd be invigorated by a little recreation, and they certainly deserve it. Doi, I answered. This may also seem blunt, but our crew has never been in battle, where the slightest mistake may mean death for ship and shipmates as well as oneself. They may curse me now and think me harsh for imposing this rigorous training, but I want you, their officers, to understand that I insist on this regimen because it is better for them to suffer here in training than to be killed by the enemy. The brief, clumsy silence that followed was broken by Lieutenant Hiroshi Kayanuma, the chief engineer. Gentlemen, I share Captain Hara's feelings. In recent months, many of our destroyers have been sunk and Captain Hara has seen it happen. We are lucky to have a division commander of his experience. Let us set a proper example. Quit beefing and take advantage of his skill and experience. Those of us who do not know enough to appreciate him now will find out before long how grateful they should be to Captain Hara. Yamagami proposed a final toast to me, in which all the officers joined. The party broke up and we all went to night combat stations. Walking back to the bridge, I said to Yamagami, I feel sorry for you, Skipper, having to put up with a son of a bitch like me who dictates so concerning your crew. Normally a division commander leaves the running of a ship to her captain. I cannot explain further why I am compelled to take charge in Shigur, but I do appreciate your cooperativeness and hope that you will someday understand. Yamagami nodded meekly. Had he been forceful or obdurate as Shigur's skipper, he could have made my task most unpleasant. Fortunately for me, he was most cooperative and obliging. After six weeks of training, Shigur was assigned to guard duties at Truk. This involved escorting transport ships in and out of the harbour, and also being on the lookout for enemy submarines. These light duties did not interrupt my training programme in any way. Meanwhile, the overall war situation was not improving for Japan. After withdrawing from Guadalcanal, Japanese forces fell back to dig in on other islands up the Solomon's chain, but the enemy's offensive capability seemed to be growing far faster than Japan's defensive capability. Admiral Minechi Koga, who succeeded Admiral Yamamoto as Commander-in-Chief Combined Fleet, continued the tactics of his predecessor. Destroyers and light cruisers were committed piecemeal into battle. These expendable elements, working desperately day and night, scored occasional local victories, but failed to change the tide of the war. With the retreat from Guadalcanal, Japan's most forward defence line in the Solomons lay in the New Georgia Group. There were bases at Munda on the main island and at nearby Kolombangara, with a total of about 10,500 troops in the area. It was here that the US Navy drove a wedge on June 30, 1943, with landings on the northern tip of Rendover Island and at Vangunu Island. These landings posed a threat to the Japanese bases, and Admiral Koga ordered maximum reinforcements for the garrison troops. Our destroyers were again called into action on Tokyo Express assignments for this ferry service. Carrying tremendous loads of men and supplies, these ships fought fierce battles against better equipped and numerically superior enemy forces on the 4th, 6th, 12th and 19th of July. In spite of distinct disadvantages, these plucky little ships gave good accounts of themselves. Particularly brilliant were the exploits of five destroyers in Kula Gulf on the night of July 12. Indeed, their success outshone the November battle off Guadalcanal in which I had taken part, and the famed Tanaka action of November 30 in the same vicinity. In the Kula Gulf battle, a Japanese force of light cruiser Jintsu and destroyers Yukikaze, my old teammate, Hamakaze, Mikazuki, Ayanami and Yugure, 
took on an Allied force consisting of two US and one New Zealand cruisers and ten destroyers. The engagement opened around midnight when Jintsu repeated battleship Hye's blunder of using searchlights and was promptly sunk by concentrated gunfire. In the ensuing action cruiser, Leander was knocked out by torpedoes. The Allies made the mistake of dividing into two groups. One of these, consisting of four destroyers, failed to engage any Japanese ships. The five Japanese destroyers, storming back and forth, completely outmaneuvered the other group, knocking out cruisers St. Louis and Honolulu and sinking destroyer Gwyn. In the confusion, destroyers Woodworth and Buchanan collided, and the Japanese ships returned to base, damaged but triumphant. Yet the loss of that one cruiser was more costly to Japan than were the casualties Yukikaze and her colleagues inflicted on three cruisers and three destroyers of the Allies. At Truk, I heard of Yukikaze's exploits with some envy. She had not had great achievement in battle when teamed with Mayamatsukaze in late 1942, but she was the only ship to survive the Bismarck Sea Battle without a scratch. With her Kula Gulf exploit, she was becoming a ship of some note. I vowed to match her exploits with my Shigura when we were ordered to move to Rabaul on July 20. I was glad to get the orders. So far I had been a division commander in name only, since all my ships but Shigura were assigned to other commands. Two of my destroyers, Yugure and Ariake, were at Rabaul. It was stimulating to think of having three of my ships together at one time. I knew that Yugure, having just come from earning glory with Yukikaze in the Kula Gulf battle, would be a great asset to the division. My feelings were shared by Shigura's entire crew, and their morale soared when they heard of Yugure's exploits. They were tired after almost four months of intensive training, but they rejoiced at the prospect of moving to the front and having the chance to engage in battle. Shigura headed south at a steady 18 knots, loaded to capacity with plane parts badly needed at Rabaul. I thought of how the weeks of recent training had transformed Shigur's sloppy, dispirited crew into a snappy, hard-working team. I had been very sparing with praise during their training, but they had done a good job. Still, experience had taught me that one real action teaches more than a thousand manoeuvres. I would save my praise until they had withstood their baptism of fire, and hope that the acid test would not find them wanting. I was eager for battle. Yukikaze had been successful, and if she could succeed, we could. The voyage to Rabaul was eventless, and we arrived on July 23. I reported at once to the headquarters where a staff officer silently handed me a report. I scanned it hastily and was stunned. Destroyers Yugure and Kiyonami had been sunk south of Choiseul on the 20th. They were part of a transport mission to Kolombangara, which had been thwarted a week earlier and were trying again. The entire crews had perished, 228 in Yugure and 240 in Kiyonami. Thus, the enemy had avenged their losses at Kula Gulf within a week. As soon as Shigura's cargo was unloaded, I told the crew what had happened to the two destroyers. They listened in silence and, I gathered, began to feel that all their training had been worth the effort. Destroyer Division 27 was still my command in name only. But Ariake returned on the 21st with two other destroyers from a successful supply mission to Kolombangara. This trio had chosen Vela Gulf as their approach route instead of Kula Gulf. A powerful enemy force of four cruisers and three destroyers were on the prowl in Kula Gulf, but they did not find out until too late that the Japanese destroyers had entered and departed on the other side of the island. Rabaul, supply base for all Japanese forces in both the Solomon Islands and the New Guinea theatres, was a hectic place in the summer of 1943. Destroyer Shigure was allowed to rest, but checkups, familiarisation cruises and the like kept it from being a rest for just six days when orders arrived to join with three ships of Destroyer Division 4 on a transport mission to Kolombangara. We were to take the route through Vela Gulf that had been used so successfully by Ariake ten days earlier, because headquarters said this route was safe enough. I did not share this complacency, however, because of my observation that a repetition of the same operational formula usually ended disastrously. We should not expect that the enemy's cruisers and destroyers would again obligingly waste time and fuel in Kula Gulf. The tragedy of Yugure and Kiyonami should have been example enough that we could not count on the enemy for such stupidity. On the 1st of August, we steamed out of Rabaul in a column led by Amagiri. 
As lead ship and scout for the force, she carried no cargo. The following three destroyers, Hagikaze, Arashi, Shigura, were loaded with a total of 900 troops and 120 tons of supplies. I was apprehensive on my first real sortie of the year. In my absence from action, the seas of the central Solomons had claimed many illustrious destroyers. Kagero, Kuroshio and Oyashio, veterans of Tanaka's victorious battle off Savo Island, were sunk by mines and air attack on May 8, 1943. My Java Sea battle teammate Nagatsuki and Nizuki were lost in these waters in July. Hatsuyuki, hero of the October 1942 Savo Island battle, was blasted into the ocean depths near Bougainville on July 17. I became lost in these contemplations on Shigura's bridge, watching the darkening ocean, and wondered how many and which of the four ships on this sortie would survive. As night came, I was relieved to see that it was pitch dark and hoped that luck would be with us. We entered Blackett Strait, which threads between Kolombangara and three smaller islands to the southwest. Both sides of this hazardous, narrow waterway are lined for miles with dangerous reefs and shoals. Engines were stopped at the rendezvous point, and our three loaded ships drifted in silence. Dozens of barges came swiftly out from shore to receive our cargo. Working very efficiently, they cleared our ships of all troops and supplies within 20 minutes. It was a great relief to see Hagikaze's hooded lamp signal. Let's go home. Amagiri went ahead to lead the way while the other three of us warmed engines, and within five minutes we were headed back through the weird and treacherous waterway. I had alerted Shigura's bridge and lookouts for any sign of danger. The enemy with his tight scout networks in this area must have detected our activities and might spring out from any of the myriad shoals that lined the maze like straight. Ten minutes after getting underway from the rendezvous, we were making 30 knots through the confined waters. This was a truly breakneck speed for such a dangerous waterway. In peacetime, no ship would have ventured here at night in excess of 12 knots, even with all lights burning. We, of course, were running fully blacked out. The night was sultry, but cold sweat stood out on every brow. We passed Arundel and Wana Wana and caught up with Amagiri as we drew a beam of Gizo. We then drew into a tight column formation with only 500 metres between ships. My eyes, well adjusted to the darkness, suddenly caught the movement of a small black object moving swiftly from the left toward Amagiri, which was some 1,500 metres ahead of Shigura. I could not determine what the object was, but groaned, Here it comes, and braced for a fearsome explosion at any moment. The black object melted into the darkness and was gone, with no explosion, no flash, no fire. It was mystifying. The suggestion of bustling activity on board Amagiri was borne out when her veiled lamp flashed a swift message. Enemy torpedo boats encountered. One rammed and sunk. Hagikaze and Arashi machine guns suddenly barked, and I saw them fire a torrent of bullets to starboard. Two violently burning torpedo boats came into view near the two destroyers. I gave the order for Shigur's guns to open fire, and the crews, who had been standing by with fingers on triggers, responded beautifully. The flaming craft disappeared into the black water as if they had never existed. Cheers of joy and laughter sounded and echoed in each of our destroyers as we continued running at top speed. I understood the elation at our good fortune, but could not join the merrymaking. My spine was still creeping at the thought of the close shave we had had as I recalled the loss of Terutsuki in December 1942 to motor torpedo boats. This new Japanese destroyer of 3,470 tons was sunk as the result of two hits by torpedoes delivered by a couple of 50-ton torpedo boats. The same fate could have just as well befallen us this night if the enemy had spotted us and reacted a few minutes earlier. Outside of Vela Gulf, we slackened speed and returned uneventfully to Rabaul. Our crews were still exultant about the victory, but I was apprehensive and glum. Reason for the glumness appeared when I reported to headquarters and received an official report that awaited me. Destroyers Mikazuki, Destroyer Division 30, and Ariaki, Destroyer Division 27, while on a transport mission to Tuluvu, New Britain, grounded near Cape Gloucester on July 27, and were attacked next day by B-25s which demolished them completely. Only seven crewmen were killed. I returned sadly to Shigur, once again commander of a one-ship division. How swift the tempo of attrition. 
Of the glorious Quintet of July, only two ships remained a month later. How could both Mikazuki and Ariaki have been so clumsy and inept as to run aground? Depressed and dispirited, I downed several bottles of sake that night. Yamagami joined me in drowning sorrow for an hour or so, and then retired. I stayed up and drank myself into a stupor. Two days later, on the morning of August 4th, Captain Kaju Sugiura, commander of Destroyer Division 4, invited Yamagami and me to his flagship to attend a conference. The day was sunny, and we had a pleasant boat ride over to Destroyer Hagikaze. The conference table and chairs set up on the foredeck were shaded by a small awning. We were the last to arrive, and the skippers and execs of the other destroyers gave us a cordial greeting. Sugiura, several years my senior and a staff college graduate, opened the conference with a general greeting and then stated the business of the day. Gentlemen, I am very happy to report that our last transport mission to Kolombangara was a complete success, thanks to your splendid cooperation. Both the Navy and the Army High Command are gratified and have asked me to extend their appreciation to you. They have also ordered that the mission be repeated the day after tomorrow. Kawakaze will replace Amagiri, whose nose was bruised in ramming that torpedo boat. I invite discussion and will welcome your opinions and suggestions. Looking around, I saw that the skippers of Sugiura's destroyers were listening with impassive obedience. They would offer no dissenting voice to anything Sugiura said. Yamagami of my Shigur was squirming uneasily. Being the only other officer of Captain Rank in the conference, I spoke up. Captain Sugiura, I understood you to say that we are to repeat the mission. Does that mean we are to conduct this operation in the same way as the last one? Yes, Hara. We shall go through Vela Gulf and Blackett Strait again, and unload at the Columbangara anchorage at 23.30, exactly as we did last time. Begging your pardon, Sugiura, I do not think it wise to repeat the exact same formula again. This same procedure has already been used twice in Vela Gulf. Can't we vary the course somewhat this time? Black it straight by itself, with all those reefs and shoals, is unhealthy enough, without using the identical route for getting there again. How about fainting through Gizo Strait before sneaking into Blackett? Or how about just changing the timing by two hours either way? Hara, I see your point, but I already have my orders. To alter them in any detail such as you suggest would involve great changes for all parties concerned, especially in communications. And you know how poor the army garrison's communication system is. If Blackett Strait is unhealthy for us, it is dangerous for the enemy too. Their torpedo boats can get lost in the maze of reefs before they spot us. Sujura's three skippers meekly nodded their agreement. It was plain that any counter-proposals I might make would be opposed by everyone except Yamagami. I felt a bit dizzy. My ears heard the din of the words from Musashi Miyamoto's memoirs. It is bad to repeat a formula, and to repeat it a third time is worse. When the opponent thinks high, hit low. When he thinks low, hit high. Sugura was no stranger to me. We had been friends for many years. He was highly regarded by our superiors. There were already indications that he would reach flag rank. A man in such circumstances seldom argues when the high command gives orders. He broke the silence and continued in a conciliatory tone. If it is agreeable with you, Hara, I should like to have Shigura be scout ship for the force. That will free you from carrying burdensome cargo and give you a free hand. The former scout ship, Amagiri, has been replaced by Kawakazi, and the crew lacks experience. With your experience and skill, you would do a perfect job of scouting for the force. This was a clever move on Sugura's part. It tended to place me, his only vocal opponent to following the operation orders, in the position of having to accept from him a favoured position of responsibility in this operation. All eyes were on me, awaiting my response. Fortunately, I was able to answer with complete truthfulness, I appreciate your consideration, Sugiura, but cannot accept your proposal. My listeners could not have been more surprised, and the skippers looked appalled at my having answered in this fashion. I continued, Shigura, a sluggish and creaking hulk, is the oldest of our four. Its 42,000 horsepower engine needs overhaul so badly I doubt if she can make 30 knots. She is unfit for scout duty. I recommend that this duty be assigned to Commander Koshichi Sugioka in Arashi. His new ship, with its 52,000 horsepower engine, can easily make 35 knots. 
Sugiura squirmed slightly as an awkward silence prevailed. He looked at Sujioka, who averted his gaze and said nothing. Mild-tempered Sujiura finally broke the silence with a sigh of resignation. Very well, gentlemen, he said. Flagship Hagikaze will lead the column and serve as scout ship, but she will carry her share of troops and supplies. Following her will come Arashi, Kawakaze and Shigure will bring up the rear, with 500 metres distance between ships. This will give us a compact but manoeuvrable formation. Is that satisfactory, Hara? In view of his tolerance and patience with me, I had to agree with this arrangement. It was obviously futile to question the wisdom of the operation itself. The conference moved into a discussion of technical details. The plan was to leave Rabaul early in the morning so as to arrive in the area covered by the enemy's Russells-based air patrols after nightfall. Sugura assumed that these US patrol planes covered a range of 300 miles. His assumption was probably right as of a week earlier, but we had no right to assume that patrols might not now come from the more advanced base at Rendova, which had been in operation since early July. Also, our force could be spotted by enemy submarines, but this was not taken into consideration. The more I thought about these things, the more upset and uneasy I became. Still too clear in my mind was the miserable fate of the two ships of my division which were lost while under another command. The conference lasted about two hours. I remained silent and glum as we departed for Shigura. In the boat, Yamagami said, Captain, I was surprised at your courage in speaking up like that, but I'm afraid those destroyer division four officers took a dim view of your contentions. It was not a matter of courage so much as saying what I had to say. As to what they think of me, I do not care, but I do care for men's lives. This operation at best is unreasonable. Now I simply pray that luck will be with us. I have always looked back on that conference with deep regret. I should not have yielded to the idiotic policy of the high command. Had my views prevailed, hundreds of lives might have been saved in a single operation, and many times that number in ensuing months. Yet under the strict hierarchy of command prevailing in the Navy, there was no way my objections could have any effect. I learned later that even my futile protest at the beginning of the conference aroused much criticism of me when word of it spread among the officers at Rabaul. We sorted from Rabaul on August 6th at 3 and headed southward in a calm sea. The cloudy sky offered intermittent rain squalls and brief glimpses of sunshine. We were passing Buka Island at 14.30 when an enemy patrol plane was seen disappearing into the clouds. Our radio men reported hearing an urgent coded message, which must have been the plane's report of our approach. Clearly our operation would not take the enemy by surprise. I kept close watch of flagship Hagikaze to see how Captain Sugiura would react to this development. It grieved me to see our same speed of advance and course maintained, even after we had been sighted by the enemy. I gritted my teeth and followed along. We entered Bougainville Strait at 19, and turning to a course of 140 degrees, boosted speed to 30 knots. Two hours and 20 minutes later, we were directly northeast of Vela La Vela Island. Shigure was falling behind the formation, as the 30 knot speed proved too much for her. The navigation officer, Lieutenant Yoshio Tsukihara, came to report to me. Sir, we are lagging thousand meters behind Kawakaze. Shall we use the overboost to gain back our lost 500 meters? No, I roared. This is good enough. To hell with the prescribed 500 meter distance. Don't overboost the engine. Kolombangara loomed to starboard, its towering volcanic peak overhung with ominous black clouds. To port I could see nothing but blackness, from which anything could emerge at any moment. It made my spine creep. I shouted new orders. Stand by for action. Aim all guns and torpedoes to port. Set gun range of 3,000 metres. Set torpedoes to run at 2 metre depth, angle 20 degrees. Double all lookouts. For the next 10 uneasy minutes, I peered searchingly to port for some sign of activity or movement to betray the presence of the enemy. Visibility was no more than 2,000 metres in this direction. The growing tension was shattered by the voice tube from torpedo control, where Lieutenant Doy asked if it was all right to return the tubes from port side to their original starboard position. I shrieked an emphatic, no, and followed with a more controlled explanation. No, Doy, for heaven's sake, no. Starboard visibility is so good that we can see the reefs of Vela La Vela. To port we see no more than 2,000 metres, 
and we don't know where the enemy is. Stay trained to port and be ready for action at any moment. This bit of instruction was hardly finished when Lookout Yamashita called. White waves, black objects, several ships heading toward us. I called at once for full starboard helm and ordered torpedoes launched at portside targets. The white waves were plainly visible. I shuddered and glanced at the three leading destroyers. They were proceeding straight ahead, oblivious of the closing enemy ships. Damn, damn. Shigur was now 1,500 metres behind Kawakazi. 45 seconds after the order was given, Shigur began swinging to starboard as her torpedoes leapt in rapid succession into the water. The time was 21.45. As the eighth torpedo was about to be released, I caught sight of telltale white torpedo tracks fanning out in our direction, the nearest within 800 metres. I shouted again for hard starboard helm. In the same moment I saw a pillar of fire shoot up from a midship of Arashi, and two from Kawakazi. Lead ship Hagikaze was beyond and in line with these two victims, so that I could not see her. Looking again at the water, I held my breath. Three torpedoes were streaking towards Shigur's bow, which was swinging rapidly to the right. My knees almost gave in as I clutched the handrail. The first torpedo passed twenty metres ahead of the bow, the second was closer, and the third appeared certain to hit. It did not, however, or if it did, it was just a glancing blow on the skin of the rapidly turning ship. I thought I felt a dull thud from aft, but could not be sure. Looking around again, I saw several torpedoes running thirty metres or more in front of the bow, as the ship was completing a full circle in its desperate evasive turn. I called for a reverse turn. Port helm, half. When a destroyer is running at thirty knots, it takes the better part of a minute for the helm to answer the wheel. I looked around anxiously. Fortunately, there were no more torpedoes in sight, and I had a chance to look at my watch. It was 21.47. Those two minutes just passed were the most breathtaking ones of my life. Lookout Yamashita announced gleefully that one of our torpedoes had scored a hit, raising a great explosion amid the enemy ships. This was a needed shot in the arm for the men and officers of Shigur, who had been wondering when their own ship would be hit. Shouts of joy were short-lived when it appeared that no enemy ships had been hit. It was later ascertained that the exploding torpedo observed by Yamashita had been triggered upon crossing the wake of one of the enemy destroyers. The Japanese oxygen fueled torpedoes were so sensitive that they often exploded upon hitting a ship's wake, but no American ships were hit in the action. The enemy performed superbly that night and did everything right. I felt certain that some of my torpedoes were going to hit, but the enemy destroyers made a 90-degree turn to the east, just in time to evade us. I asked the radio room what had been heard from our other destroyers. The reply came back at once. Arashi and Kawakazi sent brief messages saying they were hit by torpedoes. We have heard nothing from Hagikaze. After ordering that efforts be continued to keep contact, I ordered a smoke screen to mask our movements. Then I wondered what to do next. Shigur was heading northwest, away from the battle zone. I could not quit like this. A quick review of the situation convinced me that the enemy had ambushed us brilliantly and that Shigur was now at a distinct disadvantage. I recalled the night off Guadalcanal when my ship made a solo run against the enemy column and sank destroyer Barton. Now the tables were turned. The enemy was coming at me and it was no solo run for them. Judging from the many torpedo tracks we could see, several ships must have fired in concert the hits on Arashi and Kawakazi were phenomenal. Never before had I seen such marksmanship by the enemy. We had been taking altogether too casual a view of his torpedo technique. The Americans took full advantage of the situation this night. I could not leave my friends in the lurch, and yet there was little I could do against an opposition greatly outnumbering us. With no message from Hagikaze, there was always the chance that she was still afloat. I ordered torpedoes prepared, and announced that we were going back to fight. It was 21.51 as Shigur turned around. A minute later, tremendous fireworks filled the sky some three miles ahead. Torrents of flares and flaming projectiles shot up in every direction with blinding brightness. The enemy was bombarding our destroyers, which were soon in their death throes. While Shigur made way toward this holocaust, I asked for reports of radio contacts with our other ships and of our own readiness for battle. There was no answer to our call, and I learned that Shigur's rudder was not functioning properly. 
the thought came back to me of the ominous thud I had heard earlier. It was not until Shigor went into dry dock four months later that we found in the rudder a hole nearly two feet across. An American torpedo had passed right through it without exploding. I was in agony on the bridge, handicapped with a load of 250 troops and tons of deck cargo. How could this destroyer fight single-handed against the odds of an apparently undamaged enemy force? At Guadalcanal, I had made three mistakes and lost 43 men. How many mistakes would there be this time, and how many men would I lose? Shigur was still approaching the scene of action when the gunfire ceased abruptly at 2210. The area was thrown into complete darkness, and it seemed certain that our three companion ships were sunk. The triumphant enemy must be waiting in the darkness for just the right moment to jump Shigura. When a final check showed no response from our other ships, at 22.15 I gave the order to withdraw. It was a hard decision, but there was no alternative. We informed Rabaul that we were ready to leave the area and requested instructions. Headquarters came back at once, saying... Return to base. Ask Columbangara to rescue survivors. Thus ended the Battle of Vela Gulf in a perfect American victory. Three Japanese destroyers were sunk. Of their 700 crewmen and 820 troops, only 310 survived. Among them was Captain Sugura. He had drifted ashore some 30 hours after the sinkings and roamed the jungles for a week before being rescued by a search party. It pained me to see Sugura when he returned to Rabaul on August 20, emaciated and ashamed. Survivors recounted how they had seen the fatal torpedoes only within a few hundred metres of their ships. Two torpedo hits on Hagikaze had instantly silenced her radio. Arashi was hit by three torpedoes and Kawakaze by two. It was one of the most astounding torpedo successes in history. An eighth enemy torpedo hit Shigur's rudder. Had it not been a dud, Shigur would have shared the fate of the three destroyers of Destroyer Division 4. The American score for this action was very high by any standard, and it was shockingly so to Japanese experts who thought the enemy weak in torpedo effectiveness. It was not until after the war that I read American versions of this battle and found how the victory had been won. Our destroyers had walked into a shrewdly laid trap which took full advantage of the cloaking Kolombangara Mountains. The enemy had learned of our approach early and kept track of our force throughout the day. Six American destroyers had left Tulagi at 9.30, and they were well informed of our movements toward Vela Gulf. In the Gulf, these ships' radar picked us up at a range of almost ten miles. Thereupon, the enemy force split into two groups of three ships each. Dunlap, Craven and Maury were to make the first torpedo run, the others to follow as needed. The shooting of the first group was so good that the second group needed to join only in the finishing gunfire. The victory would have been perfect if they had pursued Shigur, but our smokescreen must have been effective in making the enemy think we were done for. The significance of the American victory was finally realised at Rabaul. Never again did headquarters try to reinforce Kolombangara through Vela Gulf. Shigura returned late in the night of August 7th to Rabaul, where headquarters was in a turmoil. Our loss of Munda on the 4th, followed by the unprecedented defeat of our destroyers in Vela Gulf, was a shock to everyone. Across the narrow Blackett Strait from Munda was the main Japanese bastion of the Solomons, Kolombangara. I could understand why the enemy destroyers opposing us at Vela fought with such authority. I was greeted ruefully by the 8th Fleet Commander, Vice Admiral Tomoshige Samajima, but he said not a word of criticism of my actions. He was remorseful at having sent Destroyer Division 4 into a trap on a foolish repeat mission. On return to my ship, I had the 250 army troops and their supplies put ashore. Most of the soldiers were terribly sick after huddling more than 40 hours in the cramped, stinking spaces below deck. They shouted with joy as they staggered down the ramp to solid land. They realised what a narrow escape we had had and bowed a grateful farewell to Shigur and her crew as they marched away. It made me feel that my decision had been the right one. I gave my crew the next day off and let them go ashore, one third at a time. It was their first real rest and a well-earned one. When I saw Petty Officer Yamashita, the lookout who had discovered the enemy, among the first group to go ashore, I called him to my cabin. There I handed him my silver watch and said, You did a great job. I want you to have this. It is not much. I bought it twenty years ago at Wanamaker's department store in New York City. 
I cannot accept it, sir, Yamashita protested. I must not take a thing of such special significance for you. I merely fulfilled my duty. If my act deserved a reward, it should come from headquarters. Take the watch and stop arguing with me, Yamashita. The High Command will not give you anything. They have actually denied our claimed torpedo hit because your sighting was not witnessed. Oh, Captain Hara, that is wrong. I saw the torpedo hit just as I saw the approaching enemy. I have never lied in my life and will fight anyone who calls me a liar. Come now, Yamashita. You know how the service can be. Forget it. Go ashore and have a good time. I put the watch in his pocket. He looked bewildered for a moment, smiled, saluted, and withdrew. I sat down to the difficult job of writing a detailed action report of the Vela Gulf battle. I had to be honest, and at the same time I wanted to defend my colleagues. Hours passed before the work was completed. As I stepped out on deck to relax, the first shore party was returning. Yamashita stood out from the rest of the group because of his dishevelled uniform, swollen face and blackened eye. When I called for an explanation, he stammered, It is nothing, sir. I just stumbled and fell. You said this morning that you do not lie. Don't try to fool me. Do you think I cannot tell when a man has been beaten up? I am very sorry, sir. Forgive me for telling you the first lie of my life. I tangled with some rascals ashore, but they did not beat me up. Come to my cabin and explain what happened. This usually cocky young man followed sheepishly to my cabin. There I demanded a full explanation. Well, sir, I had a few drinks and was having a good time. Maybe I got a little drunk. I showed off the watch you gave me. Then some rascal said that Shigur had retreated in shame and was a disgrace to the Navy. Another joined in saying that Destroyer Division 27 was a bunch of bums. That did it. I lit into both of them and gave them what they deserved. The rascals. Shame on you, Yamashita. Do you think Shigur's action was wrong? No, sir. I believe your judgment was absolutely right. That's why these stupids made me mad. You should have ignored them. We are here to fight the enemy, not our countrymen. Don't feel bad about it now. Blow your nose and go to sick bay for treatment. Next time you will know better. The atmosphere in Shigur changed radically after Vela Gulf. The crew was transformed overnight into a proud, tightly woven team. No more beefing, no more sullen faces. This happy development made our whole ordeal of training and battle worthwhile. This team would have confidence in its next battle, and it was not long in coming. The Americans continued their advance and carried out a new landing operation on August 15 at Biloa, near the southern end of Vela La Vela. This new beachhead and the one at Munda formed a pincer on our 12,000-man garrison at Kolombangara. The reaction of the Japanese High Command was to throw in all available aircraft over Biloa and then land reinforcements at Horanyu on Vela La Vela to counterattack the new enemy beachhead. On the morning of August 16, Yamagami and I attended a conference in Destroyer Sazanami, presided over by the commander of Destroyer Squadron 3, Rear Admiral Matsuji Ijuin. It had already been announced that he would lead the Hiranyu operation in person. When ordered to direct this operation, Ijuin said, I urged the High Command to discontinue the use of destroyers for transport purposes. Accordingly, our destroyers will function purely as escorts. Escort squadrons of a year ago never had fewer than eight destroyers, but we must be content with four because of the high attrition rate of recent months. But I have hand-picked these four outstanding ships, and I know that their fighting strength will be as the strength of eight. Ijuin then asked me to brief the conference on the Vela Gulf action, and he listened just as intently as the others. When I had finished, he spoke again. I wholeheartedly endorse Hara's remarks, and I commend to you his actions in that battle. Remember his cautiousness and flexibility. In the present operation, our duty is to guard the convoy, not to seek duels. I disapprove of the dogged inflexibility which has proved such a detriment to our navy. This reference to the four ships as the best at Rabaul was no mere flattery. My Shigur was the only one which was not of the very latest type. Hamakaze, hero of the July 13 battle at Kula Gulf, was one of the rare Japanese warships to be equipped at this time with radar. She and sister ship Isokaze formed Destroyer Division 17, commanded by Captain Toshio Miyazaki. These and Ijuin's own flagship, Sazanami, formed the escort for the operation. This little squadron could boast the rare lineup of a rear admiral and two captains. 
Furthermore, Ijuin, with his stress on flexibility, gave each of us captains a free hand in making preparations, and the freedom allowed to Ijuin by the High Command showed how impressed they had been by the Vela Gulf debacle. This four-ship squadron left Rabaul at three on August 17, and sped southward to rendezvous with our convoy of twenty small landing barges. They set out from Buin bougainville at 10.27 the same day, carrying 400 reinforcements for Haranyu. We were still within 100 miles of Rabaul when our radio intercepted a message from an airplane very nearby. Since the enemy thus knew of our movements, it was essential that we learn what we could of his. Accordingly, Ijuin promptly radioed the Buin air station to double its scout plane missions. The first message from any of our scout planes came at 13.30, just as Bougainville appeared on the southwestern horizon. The sighting report said, Three large enemy destroyers in Gizo Strait headed toward Biloa. This information was received in our force with mixed feelings. I was relieved to know something about the enemy's movements. It was so much better than my last mission when we had to advance with no knowledge of the enemy deployment. Our ships were bent on 28 knots toward Bougainville Strait. We had to rush lest the enemy maul the unescorted convoy which was advancing slowly along the Choiseul coast. The sun set while we sped through Bougainville Strait. The night's full moon was obscured by heavy weather. Clouds hovered at 1,500 feet, and visibility was no more than three miles. These conditions favoured the enemy with his vastly superior radar, and we knew it. At 21, Vela La Vela loomed dead ahead on the horizon. We were nearing our goal, and very likely, a showdown with the three enemy destroyers. The tense silence of our march was suddenly broken by the booming voice of Lookout Yamashita. Enemy plane! A sleek bomber swung overhead and disappeared into the low clouds. Just as suddenly, another plane, which appeared to be an Avenger bomber, edged out of the clouds to drop a white flare directly above Shigur. Our destroyers broke column instantly and spread out, with all guns barking at the enemy plane. We zigzagged at thirty knots and laid smoke screens, each destroyer following prescribed procedure. Another bomber came out of the clouds and dove towards Sazanami, almost scraping the flagship's masts as it flew over and released several bombs. Skip bombing, I thought, and clenched my fists in anxiety. It had been a constant nightmare for me in the five months since I had first heard of this new air attack method. My wrestling with the problem of how to evade such assaults had failed to produce any solution. The bombs aimed at Sazanami, however, did not skip. They were dropped in a conventional dive bombing and they missed, raising several white columns of water around the flagship. Sazanami's guns replied but failed to score on the daring attacker. I relaxed with relief that our ships were undamaged and the plane gone, but there was now great likelihood that more would return. Far ahead we caught sight of the convoy we were to guard. It would be an hour before we could catch up. I tried to figure what we would do if the enemy came back with many planes, but such thoughts were broken by another shout from Yamashita. This time there were two enemy planes. One twin-engined bomber dived on lead ship Sazanami. The other struck the opposite end of our column at Shigure. All our guns greeted this audacious pilot who dove literally between our masts in laying his deadly eggs before zooming up in a sharp climb. Some of our shells must have caught that bomber for... As it was about to disappear into the clouds, we saw the left wing spurting fire. When the bombs missed Shigur, I looked towards Sazanami. She was wreathed in a very thorough smokescreen. I knew she'd be safe from the attack of such mediocre bomber pilots as these. Before it was over, a total of eight bombers assailed us in this running battle which lasted almost until we reached the mouth of Vela Gulf. As the last of the planes departed, the ominous black silhouette of Kolombangara towered over us from the east. Everything was again in pitch darkness. Were we walking into another enemy trap? From the radio room voice tube, Sazanami orders one 80-degree turn to the west because of poor visibility on Kolombangara side. I was happy to obey that order, and Shigur turned immediately. Our four destroyers rejoined and started a westward march, we had gone nearly 30 miles when Sazanami signalled, four enemy ships bearing 190 degrees, distant 15,000 metres. Admiral Ijuin had kept us out of an enemy ambush. Sazanami's stern signal light kept blinking. Form combat column. Prepare for torpedo attack to port. 
Ijuin later told me how overjoyed he was to find that the enemy was pursuing us. I was positive that the enemy, overconfident after his phenomenal August 6th victory, had decided to ignore the vulnerable unescorted convoy and challenge us to a duel. I headed north to lure the enemy into battle at a safe distance from the convoy. At 22.32, our destroyers turned 45 degrees to a northwest heading, while every eye was glued to the movement of the enemy. The combat column order had shifted the positions of our ships so that radar-equipped Hamakaze was closest to the enemy and covering Sazanami, and my Shigur was another 1,000 metres northward. The enemy's continued speeding to the northeast indicated that he was not yet aware of our irregular turnaround. The distance between our forces was shrinking steadily when, at 2240, a brilliant blue and white flare blossomed above the enemy column. That signal dropped by one of our scout planes meant, enemy ships are destroyers. The US column started a rapid, sharp turn to the west. This was a shock to Ijuin, who realized that the enemy was breaking off his chase of our destroyers. This meant that the enemy would charge against our unprotected barges. Ijuin immediately ordered a 90-degree turn to the southwest for his destroyers, and called for a calculation of the enemy's speed. It appeared shortly that our destroyers could not possibly reach the enemy destroyers before they lit into our defenseless barges. Ijuin ordered, Fire torpedoes on long-range setting. He estimated the distance between Sazanami and the enemy to be 8,000 metres. To me, it appeared to be more than 10,000 metres. At such a range, there was practically no chance of scoring hits. The American ships were on an almost parallel course and making better than 30 knots. Nevertheless, a catastrophe appeared imminent, and Ijuin decided to release torpedoes. At 22.52, they were launched and sped on their deadly way, two metres beneath the surface. The 23 oxygen-driven torpedoes were about halfway to the targets when suddenly one of them leaped upward, breaking the surface of the water and raising white, billowing waves of fluorescent spray which stood out in the dark of night like a lighted signboard. The enemy column saw it too and made a rapid right turn, followed by another right turn, and our torpedoes missed completely. Admiral Ijuin watched impassively through his binoculars and said, What an evasion! but at least we distracted them from the convoy. At 22.55, Sazanami released her eight remaining torpedoes. The distance was still a difficult 7,000 metres, but the Admiral did not care. The enemy reacted with another sharp turn to the right and again evaded all torpedoes. All guns, Ijuin roared, open fire. Sazanami and Hamakaze rushed precipitously toward the enemy with guns blazing. But without searchlights, the guns were poorly aimed. Also, the distance was too great for the small 12.7mm guns of our destroyers. Isokaze and Shigure raced forward but held fire, while the two opposing groups swiftly closed. It was 2059 when I gave my next battle order. Ready for torpedoes portside? The next moment, Shigure was straddled by enemy shells, which fell 20 to 40 metres from the ship, kicking up pillars of water and spray. Another barrage, seconds later, bracketed our ship even more closely, and the third just barely missed us. I craned my neck and strained my eyes for gun flashes which simply did not appear. I realised now that we were confronted with the enemy's new flashless powder we had all heard rumoured about. That, combined with his radar-controlled guns, presented a formidable opposition. Forgetting my own plans for a torpedo attack, I ordered smoke and a zigzag course. Shigur weaved back and forth through the thickening smoke screen at her full 30 knots. But no matter which way we turned, shells kept falling around us every six or seven seconds with breathtaking, uncanny tempo. Tension rose as we realised that any moment might bring a direct hit. My torpedo and gunnery officers were crying for permission to open fire, but I knew we must hold off until the most opportune moment. We held fire while the enemy shelling continued, the enemy ships were approaching on a bearing of 60 degrees. I wanted to launch torpedoes before opening gunfire because the guns would tend to spoil the accuracy of our torpedo launchings. Enemy salvos were falling so close that they splashed water in my face. When the enemy range had closed to 5,000 metres, I gave the word to launch and turn away. I watched the torpedoes speed on their way and at the same time waited for the feeling of Shigur's response to her helm which was slow in coming. A salvo of enemy shells hit farther away, 
and then another close by. I called for gunfire and Shigur's hull quivered like a leaf with the first barrage. The din was deafening. While we continued to fire at the enemy and he at us, not a single shell hit our ship. As my ears adjusted to the roar and clatter of guns, I became aware that the masthead lookout was shouting, One torpedo hit the second enemy ship. Our guns are getting the range on the third. I could see no vestige of this through the smoke of battle, but the news brought cheers from the crew on deck. The next piece of news, the most surprising of the day, was from Hamakaze, whose radar had detected the approach of a powerful enemy force. Captain Toshio Miyazaki suggested retirement to the northwest. A message from Admiral Ijuin expressed his concurrence with Miyazaki's proposal. I immediately sent word of my complete agreement. We turned northwest at 23, followed by Isokaze. Sazanami and Hamakaze, moving together, also sped on a retirement course. Shells continued to fall about us for another ten minutes. None hit Shigur, but Isokaze was less fortunate. She desperately launched eight torpedoes at the pursuing enemy who swerved to the right, evaded them, and continued on. Near misses on Isokaze at 2312 injured some of her crewmen and set small fires. Hamakaze was also slightly damaged, but Sazanami and Shigure were unscathed. This was the second straight battle for Shigur in which she and her crew had not received a scratch. Lieutenant Commander Toshio Niwa, who commanded the convoy, later told me that his barge crews and passengers enjoyed a grandstand view of the eight destroyers in their running battle. The men applauded and cheered when they saw hits made on the American ships. The twenty barges, meanwhile, inched along the coast as the U.S. destroyers, Nicholas, O'Bannon, Taylor, Chevalier, were being lured seaward by our destroyers. The 400 troops had to spend the following daylight hours in the barges, nestled along the coast, but they were put ashore at Haranyu when night fell. The landing operation was an unquestioned success. By the same token, it must be concluded that Captain Thomas J. Ryan's destroyers failed, and in so doing left some unexplained puzzles. His ships paralleled our course until 2321, and then made two 90-degree right turns to head back toward the convoy. Some reports say he gave up the chase because his ships could make only 30 knots against the 35-knot speed of the Japanese destroyers. Shigur's maximum speed was 30 knots. With her poor rudder response at the time, I know that she and Esokazi were running at no more than 28 knots. Furthermore, the course of his column and my pair of ships, as checked by action reports of both sides, do not support his claim of having chased us. Captain Ryan's force did not even give determined chase to the barges of the convoy. It is said that his destroyers had spent all their ammunition, but they must still have had some machine gun bullets left, and that was all that would have been needed against the unarmed barges. As it was, only two of the barges were sunk, and no lives were lost in them. It may be that Ryan thought this was one of the familiar Tokyo Express runs in which the destroyers were serving as transports for the main portion of the landing troops. When we withdrew, he may have retired satisfied that he had successfully foiled our landing operation. During the battle, neither I nor any of my colleagues saw a single American torpedo. This puzzled us too, especially since this encounter came only ten days after an epical US torpedo victory in this same area. Ijuin said afterward, I believe the enemy ships must have been cruisers, not destroyers, because they preferred to fight with guns at long range. The claim by Shigura's lookout that one of our torpedoes had hit the enemy was never verified. It may have been an illusion. More likely it was an explosion, induced by a destroyer's wake. The somewhat half-hearted enemy manoeuvres after the reported hit led me to believe this latter possibility. Ijuin, of noble birth and used to having his way, was in a buoyant mood. He would hear nothing of my doubts and scepticism. Accordingly, his report to Imperial Headquarters said, The outstanding destroyer of this force is Shigur, which sank an enemy cruiser by torpedo attack. The most criticised part of the entire action was the Japanese break-off, which was sparked by Hamakaze's radar detection of a powerful enemy force in the vicinity. There is only one explanation for Hamakaze's error in this regard. Japanese radar was so unreliable in those days, it must have mistaken our convoy of barges for a non-existent enemy fleet. Since the end of the war, I have observed strong American criticism of Ijuin for his withdrawal, forsaking the barges he was supposed to protect. 
Strangely, however, there seem to have been no voices raised against the US commander for his failure to follow through in this action. It is my feeling that both commanders approached this action prejudiced and preoccupied. The August 7th debacle at Vela Gulf was obviously a strong influence on Ijuin, and Ryan had commanded one of the destroyer squadrons in the Kolombangara Battle of July 12. In that battle, one of his ships had been sunk and three others turned in a poor performance as an outnumbered Japanese force inflicted heavy damage. Historians and critics too often overlook the state of mind of the commanders in judging a military or naval action. Our four destroyers returned to Rabaul on August 18. Shigura's proud and happy crew was given the next day off. In those days of high attrition, it was a real wonder for a destroyer to go through two battles in a row without a scratch. On our previous return, there had been raised eyebrows that Shigur should be the sole Japanese survivor. This time, no one could even suggest a doubt about her valour. Admiral Ijuin lunched with Captain Miyazaki and me at the officers' club. They praised Shigura's performance until I was pleased to the point of embarrassment. Ijuin noted how greatly Shigura had changed under my command, and he concluded, I regret, Hara, that as a division commander you have had but a single ship, and that one much older than your Amatsukaze. But be patient. You will soon have other ships to command. Admiral Ijuin was a remarkably congenial and friendly person despite his noble rank of baron. Born with a silver spoon in his mouth, he had achieved a navy-wide reputation as an excellent navigator. It was gratifying to know that a man of his ability and rank was interested in one's welfare. Rabaul was enjoying a comparative quiet spell from air raids, so we left the club after lunch and went for a stroll. A balmy southeasterly breeze rustled the coconut trees. There was little fuss about formalities at this tropical base. We wore plain shirts and shorts and ordinary straw hats. Accordingly, sailors passed us without saluting for a change, and it was fun to walk unnoticed. Stores conducted business as usual, and most of them were owned by Chinese. What a tenacious people! While Japan and the Allies were engaged in savage battle, the calm Chinese of Rabaul seemed interested only in strengthening their control of the local economy. Passing an alleyway, we were attracted by a crowd gathered in an inner yard. The bystanders were watching the spirited dancing of some forty native men. They wore nothing but feathers in their hair and colourful sarongs around their waists. The rest of their sepia bodies was covered with brightly hued powders and paints, with only drum for accompaniment, they danced so vigorously that they streamed with perspiration. From time to time, native women threw bananas or other fruit to the dancers. This was devoured while the dance continued. Occasionally, they gave out loud shrieks which sounded like the quacking of ducks. We did not learn the occasion for this dance, but it was fascinating. For half an hour, we watched as the young men kicked up their feet, waved arms, and jerked their heads from side to side. It was monotonous, but strangely appealing. Miyazaki said, These people are content with their primitive way of life, bare subsistence food, crude dwellings, coarse garments, and they seek nothing more. By our standards they are lazy, but who is happier? Ijuin finally suggested a move, saying, I enjoy this dancing, but would like to visit the hot spring baths we saw earlier. Will you join me? This proposal took Miyazaki and me by surprise. We had visited the hot spring and commented in passing with the Admiral about what a good bath place it was. Now Miyazaki recovered voice before I did and said, Begging your pardon, sir, that spring is right out in the open. I have never seen an Admiral bathing there. But you have bathed there, my dear Captain, Ijuin retorted, and if you can enjoy the pleasures of the large outdoor bath, why should I have to be content with my narrow and uncomfortable shipboard bath? There was no arguing with an Admiral especially when his words were so full of pleasant logic. Taking advantage of the volcanic formation of New Britain, the Navy had built open-air bathhouses over the hot springs. Large metal drums in each enclosure served as tubs. Each bather filled his own with the clean, hot spring water. A rinsing wash, followed by a Japanese-style soaking in the tub, and the bather emerges lobster-red and refreshed. It was the most popular place in Rabaul for ship's crews, Anyone with a shore pass could bathe free of charge, and after days at sea with no bath, this was a welcome treat. But high-ranking officers had their own baths on board ship. Thus it was surprising for an admiral, let alone one who was also a baron, to visit these public baths. 
When we started to fill our drums with the hot water, two young men leaped from their tubs, saluted, and took over our work. We had returned their salutes automatically, but Ijuin quickly said, Take it easy, lads, we can fill our own tubs. Stark naked, there is no difference of rank. But the young men would not listen. When the drums were filled, they disappeared. Ijuin sighed. We seem to have spoiled their pleasure. I should not have come. The baths were wonderful. Before they were over, we had scrubbed each other's back, lined up in a row like three monkeys. It was most undignified for naval officers, but we did not care. In the course of this relaxation, Ijuin said, Professor of Torpedoes Hara, I'd like to have your critique of my action in this last operation. Sazanami's eight fish were wasted. How could we have done better? Well, in the first place, I do not think they were really wasted. Our first spreads were detected when that one torpedo malfunctioned and broached. Had it not been for that, I believe we would have had some hits. Ijuin conceded that, and further mused that the distance had been too great for even our long-range torpedoes. I continued, That's right. With the phenomenal success of the enemy's radar, I fear that all of my formulas will need adjustment. When the enemy can fire at us with the advantage of radar-controlled rangefinders, it is virtually impossible for us to close him to within 3,000 yards. That is true, Ijuin said. The enemy now has the upper hand, and it would be wiser for us not to try for a smashing victory every time. It does not pay to sink an enemy ship if it costs us too dearly in men and ships.